The drama between House representatives continues, this time between Democratic Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries and Republican Byron Donalds. It all started when Donalds was quoted by the Philadelphia Inquirer on Tuesday, saying, in part, quote, during Jim Crow, the black family was together, and more black people voted conservatively. Jeffries responded to those remarks on the House floor. Let's watch. The so-called leader has made the factually inaccurate statement that black Josh. folks were better off during Jim Crow. That's an outlandish, outrageous, and out-of-pocket observation. How dare you make such an ignorant observation? You better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Congressman Donalds didn't appreciate Jeffrey's characterization of his comments, and he said this in response. America, Joe Biden's campaign is lying to you once again, and they're gaslighting. Now they're trying to say that I said black people were doing better under Jim Crow. I never said that. They are lying. But why would you be surprised? Because they always lie. This is the same Joe Biden that said, if you don't vote for him, then you ain't black. The man is a liar. Sorry, just call it what it is. What I said was, is that you had more black families under Jim Crow. And it was the Democrat policies uh, under HEW, under the welfare state, that did help to destroy the black family. That's what I said. And I also said you're seeing a reinvigoration of black families today in America. And that is a good thing. So don't listen to the lies from the Biden administration. So let's start with the Baron Donalds thing, which yeah. I think we have different perspectives on. And I found his explanation somewhat disingenuous. And I think he was clearly trying to minimize Jim Crow and the horrific discrimination that black Americans suffered then and to suggest that because there may have been, I don't know what he means exactly, lower uh, rates of single parenthood, for example, mm -hmm. that that should somehow be looked back upon nostalgically, which seems a ludicrous position to me. Yeah, looking back on our past is nostalgically is a thing that people love to do, and mm. you will almost always fall on your face if mm. you try to do that. Um, a little piece of advice to all politicians, if you're watching, uh, please don't reference Jim Crow and that era as ever being better in any way. It's just not something that you can survive politically. Um, but I, I'm reminded of just a couple of years ago, uh, Joe Biden and AOC were talking about how Jim Crow is going to return. And then they had to endure the same sort of um, press saga where Tim Scott from South Carolina, black Republican senator, uh, goes out and he says, I keep hearing the references to Jim Crow and I ask myself how many Americans understand what Jim Crow mm. was. It's offensive, not just to black Americans, mm. but to Southerners who were living in that and it was dystopian. Mm. There's no way that you can win as soon as you reference that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's worth taking as carefully as possible mm. what Byron Donalds was saying with some degree of seriousness, uh, which is that Hakeem Jeffries, he put the spin on it, which was black Americans were better off under Jim Crow. We read the quote, that's not what he said. He said specifically, uh, black families were together. So he's talking about family formation, single father or single parenthood, kids without dads, that kind of stuff. Very common fare for Republicans and particularly black conservatives. This is something they talk about. So this is a political and rhetorical football and I just wish that they would discuss it in an honest way and I'm mm. sure Byron Donalds and Akeem Jeffries behind closed doors would have a reasonable conversation about it mm. but with microphones in their faces that's not going to happen. I mean I just think making the argument that there is greater family cohesion under Jim Crow like I just don't understand why you would even begin to make the argument like what mm -hmm. is, let's say for the case of for the reasons of the hypothetical we accept that black family cohesion was was greater under Jim Crow mm -hmm. okay and and people were you know prevented from voting prevented from equal levels of schooling often left in crushing poverty for various reasons like what's your point it, it's like getting into this morass of stuff that just inevitably appears even from a black Republican as if you're minimizing the massive and grotesque inequalities of that time.
No, I, I completely agree. Uh, but I think it's worth noting, and, and Andrew Yang kind of reminded, I think, the nation of this when he ran for president. He was talking about like GDP is not mm. the main factor that you should talk about when you're talking about how people are doing. Mm. Is the country actually well off with its GDP mm. being whatever number? That's meaningless to people. And so for Byron Donalds, you know, just a couple of data points, and, and you can find these from Robert Reich's Economic Policy Institute. That's a left word policy think tank that did a report on this very question, are black Americans better off today mm. versus in the 1950s, 1960s? And you can approach this in a reasonable way. Uh, is Hakeem Jeffries prepared to answer that black Americans today are three times more likely to find themselves mm. behind prison bars versus in the 1960s? In 1968, just after the end of Jim Crow, mm. you had 604 out of every 100,000 black Americans going through the prison system. Mm -hmm. As of 2016, that's 1,730 out of every 100,000. Mm -hmm. So right there, you're just talking about two time periods, one where people are likely to be incarcerated, one where they're not. Oh, but that's, and that's families being broken up, that's mm -hmm. kids without dads. I began my career in the criminal justice reform mm -hmm. space. That's an issue that's of incredible importance to me, the mass incarceration problem that we mm -hmm. have in this country. It's just these people don't talk about this in a way that I think is smart for public discourse. Well, I also think they talk about it in a way that assumes there's a direct cause and effect between what they prefer to ideologically identify as the cause. As I understand Byron Donald's broader argument, mm -hmm. it is that uh, the Lyndon Johnson era war on poverty policies in some way loosened family bonds or, or whatever, basically encouraged welfare dependency. I think that's what he's arguing. Now, wh what about, for example, completely different potential reasons for those changes, like incarceration rates, mm -hmm. like unequal treatment of, for example, crack cocaine versus powdered cocaine, which is yep. the most famous example offered. Government the, war on the, that community. Right, exactly. Yep. It's not just, you know, you can't just say, well, that was the war on poverty did that. There are all sorts of other plausible explanations, even if one accepts Donald's uh, characterization of the end point. Yeah, and, and there's you know another data point that relates to that is just a, like a good thing that has mm. changed since the 1960s, which is just educational mm. attainment. So mm. if you're talking about black families, two-parent households, and marriage, all groups have experienced marriage declines since the 1960s, whites, Asians, um, blacks as well. Uh, in 2000, and well, let's see, in the 1950s, 63% of black men and women lived in married households. Today that number is 35%. Let's mm -hmm. say that's just about half. But there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Education. Mm -hmm. More people go to school. More people complete high school, go on to get higher degrees, and enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's affecting everybody. So you can't really just say, boom, people mm -hmm. were better off in the 1960s. You're also better off with more education and more economic opportunity, but there are costs to that, which mm -hmm. is family formation, things mm -hmm. like fertility, childbearing is I'm not, like we're under replacement rate at this point, right? Mm -hmm. There are costs to certain elements of progress. Well, I mean, part of the reason, presumably, that marriage rates have gone down is not only the uh, educational uh, levels among different uh, groups, but the increased uh, welcome presence of uh, women in uh, higher education and in more affluent jobs and being less economically dependent, therefore, on unhappy marriages to provide them with a basic um, standard of living. I mean, the, the mere fact of economic independence itself is a, a admirable uh, uh, assistance to people trying to live the life that they wish to live, whether that's married, unmarried, or anything else. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. It's just. In general, Americans are lonely, higher, more levels of depression than we have ever seen, anxiety through the roof, and a feeling that yesterday was better than what we are headed into tomorrow. And that's incredibly toxic for our politics, but it's something that we have to contend with. If people are not happy with the present and they're fearful of the future, you know, that's why someone like Donald Trump can get away with make America great again, mm -hmm. because there was a sense that just in recent history, our parents' generation 
that something was better. But isn't there always that sense, though? I mean, there's always, always nostalgia. Always. It's nostalgia, always, nostalgia. It's always, nostalgia. <laughs> yesterday was always better, right? Yeah. But I mean, and, and that has been, I don't love the word weaponized, but that, that nostalgia is yeah. often utilized by people who want to turn the clock back. And I think this actually does bring us back to why I took sort of exception to what Byron Donald said. And I, I think you a little less so. It's it's this thing that, oh, well, if we could just resurrect this time, we could somehow pluck out off of the good parts and yeah. minimize the bad parts. And that's not how the world is. I was reading a book uh, just a couple of months ago. It's called Past Forward, How Nostalgia Can Help You Live a More Meaningful Life. And this book was very exceptional in that it made a affirmative case for the politics of nostalgia and nostalgia as a feeling, which is that it doesn't always direct us towards an impossible past. Mm. But if we have a sense of where things were better in the past, it guides us towards what we want to do with tomorrow. Mm. It actually gives us a sense of, okay, if there was more family formation, you know, married households in the 1960s, what can we do mm. to actually get people to do that? And it might guide you towards talking about marriage tax credits. It might talk to, guide you towards talking about universal daycare, stuff mm. like that. You know, these are ways that we think about tomorrow by knowing that the past had something worth offering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that is an unreasonable position in But itself. that's not what Byron Donald But that's not what Byron Donald was saying. <laughs> no, he was saying, oh, Jim Crow, fine. And it's like, it's not really. It's I'll be your communications business. director, Mr. Donald. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that's not, not great. Um, on that topic, we will have more rising mm -hmm. after this.